Hi everyone. Well, tonight I'm going to read the final two chapters of Seed Folks by Paul Fleischman. This chapter is titled Amir. In India, we have many vast cities, just as in America. There too, you are one among millions, but there at least you know your neighbors. Here, one cannot say that. The object in America is to avoid contact, to treat all as foes, unless they're known to be friends. Here you have a million crabs living in a million crevices. When I saw the garden for the first time, so green among the dark brick buildings, I thought back to my parents' Persian rug. It showed climbing vines and rivers and waterfalls, grapes, flower beds, singing birds, everything a desert dweller might dream of. Those rugs were indeed portable gardens. In the summers in Delhi, so very hot, my sisters and I would lie under it and try to press ourselves into its world. The garden's green was as soothing to the eye as the deep blue of that rug. I'm aware of color. I manage a fabric store. But the garden's greatest benefit, I feel, was not relief to the eyes, but to make the eyes see our neighbors. I grew eggplants, onions, carrots, and cauliflower. When the eggplants appeared in August, they were pale purple, a strange and eerie shade. When my wife would bring our little son, he was forever wanting to pick them. There was nothing else in the garden with that color. Very many people came over to ask about them and to talk to me. I recognized a few from the neighborhood. Not one had spoken to me before, and now, how friendly they turned out to be. The eggplants gave them an excuse for breaking the rules and starting a conversation. How happy they seemed to have found this excuse to let their natural friendliness out. Those conversations tied us together. In the middle of summer, someone dumped a load of tires on the garden at night as if it were still filled with trash. A man's four rows of young corn were crushed. In an hour, we had all the tires by the curb. I came to the United States in 1980. Cleveland is a city of immigrants. The Polish people are especially well known here. I'd always heard that the Polish men were tough steel workers and that the women cooked lots of cabbage. But I'd never known one until the garden. She was an old woman whose, whose space bordered mine. She had a seven-block walk to the garden, the same route I took. We spoke quite often. We both planted carrots. When her hundreds of seedlings came up in a row, I was very surprised that she did not thin them, pulling out all but one healthy-looking plant every few inches to give them room to grow. I asked her. She looked down at them and said she knew she ought to do it, but that this ta task reminded her too closely of her concentration camp, where the prisoners were inspected each morning and divided into two lines, the healthy to live and the others to die. Her father, an orchestra violinist, had spoken out against the Germans, which had caused her family's arrest. When I heard her words, I realized how useless was all that I'd heard about Poles, how much richness it hid, like the worthless shells around an almond. I still do not know or care whether she cooks cabbage. The young garden found this out. The, the young garden found this out with Royce. He was a young he was young and black. He looked rather dangerous. People watched him and seemed to be relieved when he left the garden. Then he began spending more time there. We found out that he had a stutter, then that he had two sisters, that he liked cats that he roamed through the garden, and that he worked very, very well with his hands. Soon all the mothers were trying to feed him. How very strange it was to watch people who would have crossed the street if they'd seen him coming a few weeks ago, now giving him vegetables, more than he could eat. In return, he watered for people who were sick and fixed fences and made other repairs. He might weed your garden or use the bricks from the building that was torn down up the block to make you a brick path between your rows. He always pretended he hadn't done it. It was always a surprise. One felt honored to be chosen. 
He was trusted and liked and famous after his exploit with the pitchfork. He was not a black teenage boy. He was Royce. In September, he and a Mexican man collected many bricks from up the street and built a big barbecue. I was in the garden one Saturday when a Mexican family drove up and we had a pig roast. A bit later, their friends began arriving. One brought a guitar, another played violin. They filled a folding table with food. Perhaps it was one of their birthdays or perhaps no reason was needed for the party. It was beautiful weather, sunny, but not hot. Fall was just beginning and the garden was changing from green to brown. Those of us who had come to work felt the party spirit enter us. The smell of the roasting pig drifted out and called to everyone, gardeners or not. Soon the entire garden was filled. It was a harvest festival, like those in India, though no one had planned it to be. People brought food and drinks and drums, I went home to get my wife and son. Watermelons from the garden were sliced open. The gardeners proudly showed off what they'd grown. We traded harvests, as we often did, and we gave food away, as we often did too. Even I, a businessman, trained to give away nothing to always make a profit. The garden provided many excuses for breaking that particular rule. Many people spoke to me that day, Several asked where I was from. I wondered if they knew as little about Indians as I had known about Poles. One old woman, Italian, I believe, said she'd admired my eggplants for weeks and told me how happy she was to meet me. She praised them and told me how to cook them and asked all about my family. But something bothered me. Then I remembered. A year before, she'd claimed that she'd received the wrong change in my store. I was called out to the register. She'd gotten quite angry and called me, despite her own accent, a dirty foreigner. Now that we were so friendly with each other, I dared to remind her of this. Her eyes became huge. She apologized to me over and over again. She kept saying, back then, I didn't know it was you. And now the... the Next chapter is titled Florence. My great grandparents walked all the way from Louisiana to Colorado. That was in 1859. They were both freed slaves and they wanted to get good and far from cotton growing country. They went over the mountains just to be safe and homesteaded along the Gunnison River, which is how my grandfather and my father and sisters and I all came to be born there. The first black family in the whole county. My father called them our seed folks because they were the first of our family there. I think of them when I see any of the people who started the garden on Gibbs Street. They're seed folks too. I'm talking about that first year before they were, there were spigots and hoses and the tool shed and new soil and before the landlord starting, started charging more for apartments that look on the garden. I would have been in on the garden for sure if it weren't for the arthritis in my hands. Growing, growing up out in the country, I still miss country things. My husband's from here. He doesn't know about the smell of a hay field and eating beans off the vine instead of from the store. I had to settle for being a watcher. I wasn't the only one. I'd seen others on the fire escapes or standing on the sidewalk like me. One day I looked up and saw a head in the window moving forward and back. It was a man who'd pulled up his rocking chair. He was watching the gardeners like TV. My grandmother's sampler from when she was a girl said, be not solitary, be not idle. That was easy all those years in the library. Being retired, it's harder. So I try to take a walk every day, which is how I found the garden to begin with. I'd always stop there to see what was new. I was just a watcher, but I was proud of the garden as if it were mine proud and protective. I remember how mad I got when I saw a man reach through someone's fence by the sidewalk and try to grab a tomato. I said, how dare you? He pulled back his hand and said he'd heard it was a community garden. It's sad every fall seeing it turn brown. Fewer and fewer people there. 
That very first year was the hardest. It had been such a wonderful change to see people making something for themselves instead of waiting for a welfare check. To see a better part of, of, of a neighborhood looking better every day. And to smell those good smells of growing plants. The green drained away, then the frost hit. You'd pass and hear those dry corn stalks shaking in the wind as if they were shivering. The pumpkins were the only color left. And, the, <clears throat> and then the boy sold them all. Some people cut up their old plants with clippers and dug them back into the soil. A few covered their ground with leaves. But once that job was done, it was done. By November, the cats were the only ones there. That winter was a cold one, cold as Colorado. You'd walk by the garden, covered with snow, just the fence tops sticking out, and you tried to remember it back in July. Someone stuck a Christmas tree there in December. It stayed up until March. It's hard to tell one month from another that time of year. It's all just winter. Because of the winter, I missed a lot of walks. When I did get out, I couldn't go past the garden without slowing down to look, even though there was nothing growing. Sometimes there'd be one of the gardeners there just looking into it. You can't see Canada across Lake Erie, but you know it's there. It's the same with spring. You have to have faith, especially in Cleveland. Snow in April always breaks your heart. I think we had two April snows that year. Waiting for the snow to melt was like waiting for a glacier to move. Finally, it was gone for good. The ground was back and last year's leaves like a, a bookmark showing where you'd left off. It was a joy to get out again. Just to walk without wearing a heavy coat and boots felt like flying. But the garden was still empty. I was disappointed. I suppose it was still too early to plant. I began to wonder if anyone would come. Maybe no one was interested. Maybe the city had shut it down or sold the lot. I was worried. Then one day I passed it, and someone was digging. It was a little Asian girl with a trowel and a plastic bag of lima beans. I didn't recognize her. It didn't matter. I felt as happy inside as if I'd just seen the first swallow of spring. Then I looked up, and there was the man in the rocker. We waved and waved to each other. It's amazing what difference one little girl made with just planting a few lima beans. She transformed a whole city block. And she made that part of her world a better place to be. And people of all colors, of all races, came together and talked and learned and, and loved each other. And they became a family because of something one little girl did. Think about that. We're all together and Jesus loves us. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for the power of new life growing in our earth and the power of hope that we can bring everywhere we go. Help us to plant seeds of hope and love and kindness in our own lives and in our communities and in our world. And Lord, help us to sleep in peace tonight, knowing you are awake. Amen. Good night, everyone.